My name is Sarah Garcia and this is Josh Lopez next to me. We are both MFA students in the Creative Writing Program here at Texas State University. We would like to begin by thanking everyone who made this event possible. Although Josh and I are presenting this unique reading to you today, we can't go without mentioning all the Texas State University departments, student organizations, and committed individuals who sponsored and supported this event. Thank you, to, thank you to the Department of English, the College of Liberal Arts, the Center for the Studies of the Southwest, the College of Applied Arts, Honors College, the College of Education, the Department of Modern Languages, the Center for Diversity and Gender Studies, the Whitliff Collections, the student organizations of Sigma Tau Delta, Latinas Unidas, Hombres Unidos, and our community host, the Centro Cultural Hispano de San Marcos. We would also like to recognize three individuals who helped us orchestrate many of the behind the scene details that provided such a rewarding campus visit for, the, for our featured authors. Muchas gracias to Dr. Jaime Mejia, Tammy Gonzalez, and Lida Guz. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and indeed, thank you to everyone who helped uh, support us to make this event possible. Uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce tonight's MC. Uh, we really do have a special event in store for you guys, as tonight marks the very first time that two San Antonio Poet Laureates have come together on the Texas State University campus. So I think you can all give them a round of applause for that. Of course, they are the only to San Antonio Poet Laureates in history, but uh, that, sh that only adds to the uniqueness of tonight's event. Um, tonight's MC is truly an amazing woman who has helped me, as well as countless others, in more ways than she'll ever know. Uh, she's the author of more than 20 books. She's been awarded five International Latino Book Awards, two Tomas Rivera Book Awards, and has been recognized by the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies for work which gives voice to the peoples and cultures of this land. Named in 2012 by Mayor Julian Castro as the first poet laureate of the city of San Antonio, she has long been considered one of the madrinas of Chicana literature. Please help me welcome tonight's Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Carmen Tafoya. State is a very special place, and the kinds of events that have been happening here over the last several years have just seemed to grow and grow in enthusiasm and in power. And the kind of excitement we find here is not found at every reading that we see throughout the nation. This is a very special place, and the people that help put these kinds of programs together. Are, are very, very special. So I thank you both for your work in organizing this and also to the many people across campus who have supported it and encouraged it and made it a part of the life and the breath of this campus. How many of you in the audience are either students or faculty at Texas Tech? So there, that's very significant in terms of the kind of reception we get for readings. Um, it's not just a few, it's nice to have the community out, but some places you go, you really don't feel the support of the institution itself. You feel more that interested, isolated segments of the community show up. But here we always get um, a very responsive and, and vibrant uh, reaction from uh, students and faculty alike. Um, these are, extremely significant events. The series that um, we are now a part of um, is a series that has always tried to find significant writers, some of them very early in their career, some of them well established in their career. I believe the last time I was on the stage it was with um, Rolando Hinojosa Smith and Arturo Madrid and um, Pino Villanueva, all of them very, very um, experienced and senior in their roles. Um, but it, 
looks deeper than just the number of years that a person's been involved in the art. It looks at the courage of the art. And that's why I feel so, so honored to be able to be Master of Ceremonies tonight for Loria and Guerrero and Tim Hernandez. Um, because these young writers are at our courageous forefront. They're pushing the edge. They're creating the edge. They're creating the frontier. They're creating the definitions for what writing is about. It's not just something that we inherit in our learning from a book. It's not just something that other writers have told us what to do and then we repeat. But instead, it's something that each generation has to redefine for themselves and create new unbound definitions, new definitions that leave movement and space to change and to grow and to become better than anything we've seen before. So it's, it's very, very exciting for me. I've also got to underline that when I look at Laurie and Tim, I think about, and I look at what kind of writing they do, I think about <clears throat> the old, not very well-known statement that writers and the artists are the prophets of society. And you see, prophet, like you think of this Old Testament guy with the long beard, <laughs> raving, saying something, you know, you know, the end is near or something. Um, I'm not talking about that kind of a prophet. I'm not even talking about a crystal ball kind of prophet who looks into the future and says, this will happen in the year 2024. Because in the Old Testament sense of the word prophet, a prophet was not somebody who predicted the future. A prophet was somebody who could interpret the present, who could look all around them at what was going on and understand it and call it and name it and say, look, the emperor has no clothes. No. Uh, I think about the painting Guernica, which said, what in the world is war doing? Is it leaving us with pieces of ourselves dripping over the edges with parts, dismembered parts of our bodies? Is it leaving society torn apart too and, and not quite balanced anymore? And the eyes began to drift to different parts of the body. And it was a way of interpreting the emotions that were relevant to the modern world. And that's what the artist has the responsibility to do. So with that said, um, I'd like to read something which uh, for me underlines a statement that I would like to say in honor of Laurien and Tim. And that is that our artists, our prophets feed us. They feed us. They feed us with the important things, not always in exotic ways, sometimes in very everyday ways. And uh, this is a point which uh, Laurie will recognize because um, it's from my collection, of Vosos, um, which was probably the hardest poetry I've ever written because I was illustrating art. I was doing it backwards. It was ekphrastic poetry. It was poetry written about art. You know, I will never again take an illustrator for granted um, in terms of their ability to go in and see something that's in words and, and put it into a visual. Well, in this instance, there was a beautiful series of 16 art paintings, um, 16 oil paintings by Catalina Garate were beautiful. They were so profound and they were so expressive but then they started to talk to me, and I started writing it down, and then I had the responsibility to write down the voices for the others. And sometimes it's hard. They, they were too good, and I needed to find their voice. The woman in the painting had to have her voice heard, not mine. And so I searched for a way to express the voices of, um, of these women in rural, indigenous Mexican settings voices that were sometimes expressed just through the color and the texture of the drape of the rebozo and <clears throat> through their very simple acts. And uh, I asked distinguished writers from across town, this was I guess two years ago, 
Um, I asked distinguished writers, women across San Antonio, to come in and read and kind of act, or I would read, and we had the painting behind us. We were kind of doing the multimedia thing, and they would kind of dramatize it, act it out. And Lorianne was the one who read, how do you say read, who dramatized the poem, acted it out, walked on stage, and so we had a painting, and we had the reflection of the painting in a real woman, a woman in the painting, a real woman on stage, and a voice, which I was trying to do. So I won't ask her to hold her little basket of taquitos for this one, but if you can imagine, she did a great job. She was draped in the reboso, and the poem was called um, Los Taquitos, these, these little tacos. And it's a, um, it's a very simple um, portrayal of a woman with a basket and her job also looking off with great longing and faith and love and loyalty, waiting for her loved one to go on break and be able to come eat the little tacos that she had made just specifically for him. And I'll, it's in English and it's in Spanish, so rather than choose, I'll kind of float back and forth in my own native text mix. Los taquitos, these tacos. Los taquitos que traigo, these tacos I made for you, for your mouth, whose taste I know so well. I know your belly too, and your hungers, your sighs and your desires, the rhythm of your chest, the softness of your breath. El modo en que me quemas con tu mirada, la forma en que me llenas con el calor de tu piel, tus ojos medio cerrados, mis labios medio abiertos, escalofrío en la espalda, tus manos, mi suspirar, tu boca, your mouth, whose taste I know so well. In these taquitos, la carne, the meat is chopped small and soft for that missing tooth of yours. They're stuffed with tomates, sprinkled with cilantro, covered with chile that bites, un besito de sal, lemon drizzled like summer rain, and always had plenty of frijoles. These taquitos I made for you, for your mouth, whose taste I know so well. And <clears throat> so we have, we have two poets who have prepared these literary taquitos for us, for the mouths of our souls who are going to be presenting to us tonight. You are in for a, a real treat. And we will have a little um, question and answer for question and answer session afterwards. So if you've got some burning questions about something you hear the read and you want to know more about it, hang on to that question in your mind. Or write it down so you can forget about it and enjoy the rest of the program. Um, and uh, our first poet to read tonight uh, is going to be introduced by Jane Holly. Uh, Jane is a third year fiction student in the Texas State MFA Creative Writing Program, and she's the co-managing editor of Front Porch, the MFA program's literary journal. Please welcome to the podium, Jane Holly. Uh, the first time I met Tim Hernandez, we were both wearing masks, and I'm not being metaphorical or writerly. Uh, we were quite literally wearing masks. I think one was of the devil and another a skeleton. Um, my fiance, Nick, who's here in the audience, another writer um, from the Central Valley where Tim and I are from, had taken me to a party after one of TZ's readings and introduced us. And Nick had been talking up TZ for a very long time, and I wasn't disappointed. Um, both at the reading and at the party, TZ's incredible passion and energy for both writing and building community were apparent and infectious. He immediately treated me like I was family, and now, four years and 2,000 miles later, I'm so honored to be able to introduce my writer brother here at Texas State. Um, Tim's a poet, a novelist, and a performance artist, whose awards include the American Book Award, the Premio Azatlan Prize for Fiction, and the International Latino Book Award. He has published three poetry collections, Culture of Flow, Skin Tax, and Natural Takeover of Small Things, as well as two works of fiction, Breathing in Dust and Manana Means Heaven. 
Uh, in addition to having created an impressive body of creative work, Tim works tires, Tyler, tirelessly, there we go, as a community organizer, history, historian, and teacher. The way he energetically puts community at the center of his personal and professional life is inspiring and demonstrates that a writer's work goes well beyond the page. Please help me in wel welcoming TZ Hernandez. Valley. And in fact, Nick uh, was one of the people who helped me do some of the editing on my enemies heaven. So it's really nice to come here and, and have uh, friends and family here as well. Um, thank you as well, Texas State and uh, Dr. Mejia and Sara Garcia and Josh Lopez and uh, Dr. Tafoya and Lorian Guerrero, who actually was one of the first people who, who uh, I think helped invite me. You know, so I'm really, um, I'm just really honored to be here, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, you know what I'm going to do is uh, I really want to spend um, a little bit of the time that I have talking about this current project that I'm working on right now because I feel like it's it's uh, it's important and I feel like this is probably the place to do it uh, because uh, everywhere I've been going in the Southwest, anyways, particularly, um, I feel like it provides an opportunity with this current research that I'm doing and so and then so there'll be some sort of in interactive uh, component to that, okay? And you all have this sort of little slip of paper and I'll tell you what that's about um, at the end of when I finish when I'm done talking, all right? I want to begin, though, by, um, by, by inviting you all to do something with me, just very briefly. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you, you know, just sit on your chair and take off your clothes. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be something very simple, in fact. Um, all you have to do and, uh, um, is, what I want to do is I want to actually sort of share with you some of what's informed what I've been writing, what I've been working on, sort of my own writing in general. And that is, um, I've always felt like I'm in conversation with my grandfather, my grandmother. Those are the conversations I was interested in. And in fact, when I write, um, in my mind, that's who I generally have as sort of my first audience. What would my grandfather think about this? My grandfather was a migrant farm worker who was uh, from Texas, from South Texas originally, from the valley. And, um, and every time I used to bring him my early poems, he would say to me, uh, I didn't understand that, you know, what does that mean? I don't understand this poem. You know, he'd always tell me that. And so I started to write towards his understanding. You know, I started to write towards that because I felt like if if my audience were only, which I'm very grateful for, but if they were only writers, I don't feel like I'd be, I feel like I'd be doing half the job. You know, what I really wanted were, um, you know, my family, working class folks, everyday folks, to see themselves reflected in the work. So in honor of our grandfather or our grandmother, you don't have to pick both. You can pick one. You can pick your favorite. In honor of them, I'd like for you to close your eyes just for a brief minute, and I want you just to picture your grandmother, or your grandfather. Picture their face, and then. Feel their name in your mouth. First, middle, and last name. Yeah. And then when we count three, all I want us to do is gently, in a light whisper, whisper their name out on the count of three. We'll do it, we'll whisper their name, and we'll open our eyes on the count of three. One. Picture their face. Two. Have their name ready. Three. Felix Hernandez. All right, thank you. <clears throat> My grandfather, like I said, was a migrant farm worker. And he, um, you know, he would, uh, in, in about 1999 or 2000, around there, he got into a pretty bad accident. Um, his job was to take the other farm workers in his van and drive them to the San Joaquin Valley in California, where I'm from, right? agricultural region. And he would drive them and, um, you know, we've, I'm sure you've heard this story before because we've all heard this story. But what happened was the van crashed. And fortunately, though, in this situation, very fortunate because it's not often this happens, the, no one died. But my grandfather broke his spine, there were other broken bones, and across that road there in the back country, is a back country road in the San Joaquin Valley, bodies were thrown in the ditch bank, and the van was turned upside down. That got me to thinking quite a bit about the altars that we see, the descansos, right? We see them all over the all over the country now, right? But um, but it, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley, um, what was on my radar, what I was seeing, were that these altars, you'd never see like one or two. They were typically, when they were on the back roads of the fields, you would see several of them, right? There were several. In fact, there was an accident that recently happened at that time where 13 people were killed, 
all 13. So you saw a giant altar with 13 crosses and standing next to the field on the shoulder of the road. And I often saw those. So this is what got me thinking about the altars. Got me thinking just also just about that situation in general. And so um, I wrote this poem. And the reason why I want to start with this poem is because I feel like it's a launching point, not just for me and the research I'm doing now, but I feel like uh, just a launching point sort of for all, all the work that, um, that I've been trying to write towards and the conversations I've been trying to have since then. So um, these are just questions. They're called questions. There's no other names. <coughs> San Joaquin Valley. Why are your back roads stricken with altars and your plastic carnations entombed among deflated balloons? What keeps the tattered photographs from disintegrating with the dew? Who dies in the back of a narrow van, limbs splayed to the heavens? Who survives? Who arrives first? Who will harvest those bodies? And who recalls them in a dream? How does one return the belongings? When names fade, where do they go? What country will claim the purgatory? What is the geography of hell? And who inherits this wreckage? How deep is the ravine of a child's memory? Are there two sides to the swallowtail's account? And what business has a worm entering a persimmon? Do crucifixes exclude? What irrigations of blood? And does a fig weep in the open air? Does water discriminate? And what about sirens? And how do we count the invisible? Can angels scale border walls? Who will open the gates for them? Who denies them? What manner of love is this? Thank you. <laughs> um, do I continue? Is that what okay? <clears throat> so um, in 2007, I was, um, I was living in Boulder, Colorado, and I, um, I was reading Jack Kerouac's book, On the Road. Uh, it was actually for a class I was taking. Uh, anyone from, raise your hand if you're familiar with On the Road, just so I see uh, anyone from the okay, Jack Kerouac's book, On the Road, right? Um, it was published in 1957. I'm going to give you the very short, abbreviated version of this back story. It was published in 1957 and went on to become uh, one of the best sellers of its time. Um, and that book, uh, you know, influenced a lot of musicians and famous artists and such that we have today, writers, obviously, as well. Um, that book was actually, uh, for those that aren't familiar with the book, it was, you know, it was created by the author Jack Kerouac, who traveled the, across the country in the late 40s and early 50s and sort of search of America and freedom in America and all that, and he wrote about his experiences. That's what the book is about. Um, in 1947, he met a woman, a Mexican girl, uh, a quote-unquote, I should say, because that's what he called it, a Mexican girl, um, a farm worker in the San Joaquin Valley where I'm from, in Fresno County. Her name was, her, in the book, her name was Terry, and her real name in real life was B. Franco. And uh, as I was reading his book on the road, um, that, in, standing in Colorado, but being from the San Joaquin, Valley, that chapter, that 20-page section jumped out at me, and I wondered, um, you know, I wondered what happened to Terry? What happened to this real woman, B. Franco, right? And then I thought, not me, certainly, but a writer could, it would be kind of cool as if a writer, fiction writer, because I studied poetry, not me, a fiction writer um, wrote a sort of spin-off, right? Just a fictional version from her point of view, right, during their time together, their 15 days together. And I thought, well, before I do something like that, I should probably make sure that it hasn't been done already. Because <laughs> by then I'd already convinced myself it was going to be me. So, <laughs> so, um, so I started to do the research, and I found out that there were over 22 books written about the author Jack Kerouac, biographies, 22 that mentioned her name and her quote unquote her backstory, a little bit about her life and who she was. Okay, 22 biographies sitting on nonfiction bookshelves today around the world, nonfiction that claimed to know a little something about B. Franco, yet not one biographer had ever, ever interviewed her. So they were only taking Jack Kerouac's point of view. They were taking for whatever he said to be fact, to be true about her. And so you had these wild disparities, and if you look at the books which exist today, we see these guesses, essentially, the guesses at who she was. Um, well, I thought to myself, great. You know, uh, I'm going to try, I'm from the Valley, I can at least find some of that sort of back information where she was from. I'm sure she worked in the same fields that my grandfather worked in, you know. And um, I discovered that she had letters in the New York Public Library. She had sent Kerouac letters, so I went to the library there in New York, and I, and I looked at her letters, and reading her letters, it sort of 
Pavel, and you can feel her, you can feel her breath coming out of the letter. She was what she was saying. She was a real woman, and I realized after a hundred pages of writing this fiction, I can't write a fiction. This is a real woman. You know, this is a real person. And I recognized, right? It was like, um, you know, it was, I recognized sort of some of the, the landscapes where I'm from in her letters in the New York Library, right? Dear Jack, I'm here at the Selma Winery picking in the cold and the labor camps. I was like, Selma Winery? That's where my grandfather worked for all the, the grapes there, you know? And um, so when I returned, um, I launched on this sort of research to try and find her family. Okay, she would not be alive, obviously. She'd be too old, but her family. The, the short version is that I discovered that, they, that she was still alive, in fact. She was aged 90 years old. And when I was, I, this was when I was living in Fresno, and she lived a mile and a half down the road from my house. So I went and knocked on her door. And eventually, after many returns and all, <laughs> and you know, them kind of, because it was also on the rough side of Fresno, you know. Um, <laughs> so they didn't trust me at the beginning, obviously. Right? The craziest part is she had never heard any of this. She never knew that over 22 books mentioned her name and her family's name and all that. So I asked her uh, two questions right up front. The first one was, has anyone ever knocked on your door and interviewed you? She said, no. I go, okay. The other one is, uh, how do you feel about being, having this legacy being known in the world as the Mexican girl? And she goes, I'm not Mexican. I was born in Los Angeles. <laughs> And um, anyways, so my book, Manana Means Heaven, uh, which I'll read a brief excerpt from right now. Um, I threw away the 100 pages, essentially, right, the fiction, and I started all over from the interview. So I began to interview her and sit down with her. Um, in 2010, we interviewed for several months, and I continued to interview her until the book was done. And so, and, and again, though she was 90 years old, so her, she was not, her memory was not, was not linear. You know, she was just thinking as memories would come up. And so the book actually becomes historical fiction, and it's sort of my way of drawing these connections between, you know, these sort of gaps in memory. But I would say that, you know, the, the irony here is that this book sits on fiction bookshelves, although 70% of it, I would, I would say, is based on, tr on her true story, 30%, you know, is fiction. Well, you have books on nonfiction bookshelves that never interviewed her, right? So, and you can, you can figure that out for all your residents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a brief excerpt from this book, though. Um, Um, so the basic premise for their, for their time together, uh, for B. Franco's time with Jack Kerouac, is that um, you know, he, he, when they met, uh, she was actually she was a married woman. And she was um, fleeing her husband. It was an abusive relationship. And she was on her way to Los Angeles. And they met at a bus station. And then they had planned to leave to New York together. So they were making plans. They had been working in the fields. They returned and worked in the fields to sort of raise money so they can, they can go to New York together. So this is, that's the background. Wednesday, October 22nd, 1947. The workers couldn't stop talking about it, especially that whole first day after it happened. According to the newspaper, a wet back was, was found strung up in a sycamore near Raisin City. From his neck dangled a cardboard sign, Parasite. The Fresno County coroner confirmed, because nowhere on the body were there bruises or scrapes, the only logical explanation was suicide, a common occurrence among Braceros, they said. Naturally, they missed their families back home. Depression was inevitable, fear constant, food too bland. A bottle of whiskey was found half empty nearby. And for Sixto Maria Martinez, all the signs were there. On this very day, you see, his contract was up. The workers knew this, and they all thought hard about it as they bent over their vines that morning in the solemn days. The fields were gray with dew, and each grape wore a thin veil of film so that its sheen was hidden. So quiet were the rows and the shuffling of feet that morning that the swallowtails perched themselves on the little branches of the vines, and they plucked the smaller grapes at will. As if things weren't bad enough, a cold snap was now creeping in over Devil's Ridge from the north and settling down into the valley, sure to cripple whatever bits of fruit were left unharvested. That morning, Bee's hands moved faster than anybody else's. Box after box was filled and carted off to be weighed and counted. Within seconds, she was right back where she left off on the very same tendril, making sure the job was done and done right. She passed other workers as if they were standing still, and for the most part they were. It seemed everyone that morning was busy scratching their heads, wondering when the raid would go down. 
Meanwhile, B kept saying in her mind, New York, the words New York. And while her feet were sunk firm in wet soil, the rest of her may as well have been in a subway barreling down the spine of Manhattan, a purse slung over her shoulder, both kids clinging to her arms. She thought about what her brother Alex had said when he told her, just five days, B, just five more little days. Hang in there. She passed the time picturing their new life, imagining the big smell of New York City, watching her kids on a playground of some brick schoolyard. So she lifted another box of grapes and hauled them off to be counted. Jack, meanwhile, trailed one row back, cutting away viciously with his curved knife, all the knots that cradled the grapes deep in their clutches. His gaze was stern and removed, and his pink face glowed in the cold. Little Albert B's son nipped at Jack's heels, raking out whatever clusters when overlooked, and he would put them down in Jack's box, like the handy assistant that he was. Each time he did this, he would look up to Jack for approval, a smile, anything to erase the worrisome look on his face. Jack watched the way the boy handled his knife and how he shot around the whole field effortlessly, offering a hand here and there, and the way he would call out to other workers in Spanish, whistling the whole way. He was a little man doing big man's work. And Jack had noticed that the fields had an army of these little men, workers, boys, whose small hands were crucial to the operation. Every last one of these boys wore a defeated mask. And if you looked at them from a distance, Jack reasoned, you'd think they were full-grown men by the way they stood, hips squared, shoulders back. The only way you could tell the boys apart from the adults was at lunchtime, when they would gather around a hole and shoot marbles. Jack observed all this. He shook his head and remembered a line from one of the great scribes of this territory, William Saroyan, who said it best about such children of the valley. He said, I was afraid of him, not the boy himself, but what he seemed to be, the victim of the world. Thank you. Now, um, this book is what led me to the current research I'm doing right now. This is where you all come in. Um, I was typing in, as I was researching my young enemies heaven, I was typing into the in Fresno Library, I was typing in the search engine, 1947 labor camps, Selma, California. And a newspaper headline appeared, and it said 100, the airplane, the headline was from 1948, January, and the headline said, 100 people see a ship plunge to the earth, 32 people killed, the worst airline crash disaster in California's history. Right? I instantly recognized that this was the incident that Woody Guthrie had wrote a famous song about, Plane Rake and Los Gatos, Deportees. Anybody hear that song? Right? So, okay, that's okay, good, good. So what happened was the Associated Press picked up the story. What was, what was happening actually was they were, they, were, they were deporting 28 Mexicans from Oakland, California back to San Diego. They were being deported. And the plane crashed and the Associated Press ran the story and said, pilot Frank Atkinson, age 30, uh, from Rochester, New York, a decorated war pilot, and went on and on to talk about the pilot, and the stewardess, and the immigration officer, and the co-pilot, named who they were and all that, and then said about the passengers and 28 deportees. And Woody Guthrie, being in New York at the time, got pretty pissed off about that, and wrote a song, actually wrote a poem. He wrote a poem about it, it was a poem first. And his poem goes, you know, what he did was he assigned names to the passengers. Goodbye, my Juan. Goodbye, Rosalita. Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the airplane. All they will call you will be deportee. Right? And that's how the song goes. Bob Dylan, Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson, they've all recorded the song. I recognized that this was the incident that it took place. I didn't know it took place in my backyard. In Fresno County is where this happened. Uh, I discovered that they were buried in a mass grave. A mass grave in Fresno, a giant patch of grass. And all there was was a placard that said, 28 Mexican nationals died in a plane crash buried here. And that's what it said. That was it. So my quest began. I decided to look for their names. Okay, and this was in 2010 because I was working on my young in heaven. And I found a list of the names of the passengers. And I went to the church. And with the help of the community, actually across the country, we raised over $10,000 and installed a new headstone last year that has not only the history of that accident, but all of their names. Okay. But my work continues. I've been doing the research, finding their families. So far, I've found six of the families. 
and I recorded their stories about who, who those passengers were. And that's the project, that's the next book I'm working on right now, is locating these families. Now, this sounds crazy, but this, this little sheet here has all the names of the passengers. And the origin, the hometowns where they're from. Okay. Pay attention here, because I'm going to end it here. If you have a last name, and your family comes from one, this place that the last name is connected to, contact me. Okay? Even if you don't know, you think that's not us. Because that's what always happens, right? We, our history and our families, usually we only know like one generation of history back, our grandparents. We know part of their story. We don't know our great grandparents' story. We don't know what happened. Manana means having is proof of that, right? We never know what happens oh, one or two generations back. So contact me, okay? I did the same thing in Stockton, California on March 31st of this year. The same exact thing I'm doing right here. And when I left two hours later, I got a phone call and someone said, This is my relative. And sure enough, I obviously I asked you questions and all that, and it turned out that. It was one of the relatives of the plane crash. They never knew what happened to the relative, right? So if you have that paper, please contact me, okay? Um, one last note. Actually, no, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> to introduce Marianne Guerrero. I can tell you the legitimate uh, biographical type stuff you'll find online, and so I'll do that first. But it doesn't say at all, and it probably doesn't even say the tip of the iceberg. But Marianne Guerrero was born and raised on the south side of San Antonio. She received the Academy of American Poets Prize, among others, at Smith College. She was a winner of the 2012 Andres Montoya Poetry Prize for her first full-length collection, A Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying, which was released by University of Notre Dame Press in 2013. Guerrero's poetry and critical work have appeared in Luis Sache, Texas Monthly, Bellevue Review, Women's Studies Quarterly, Global City Review, Texas Observer, Chicana Latina Studies, Feminist Studies, and many others. Guerrero holds a BA in English Language and Literature from Smith College and an MFA in Poetry from Drew University. Her chapbook, Babies Under the Skin, won the Panhandler Publishing Award. A Canto Mundo Fellow, a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop, Guerrero's work has been highlighted in the LA Review of Books, the Poetry Foundation, Harriet Blog, and Poets and Writers Magazine, of which she was named one of the top 10 emerging poets in 2013. Other honors include fellowships from the Alfredo Cisneros del Moral Foundation and the Artist Foundation of San Antonio. Guerrero lives and works today in the south side of San Antonio, but she's been traveling extensively on a tour um, of national university and literary Circuits, uh, Tongue in the Bunk of the Dying has been extremely exciting for, for our nation to take part in. But I've got to say that uh, she holds a unique distinction of uh, this year being named the youngest poet laureate ever named by the city of San Antonio. Uh, of course, you just heard Josh say earlier that there's only two of us, so now you know which. Uh, one of them I am. I'm not the younger of the two. Um, but she is also going to be reading for us a very significant work from her latest book, A Crown for Gumesindo. And I think that you will find why the power and the depth of her work touch us so much and have received such a response from others. Their honesty, their boundlessness, just their incredible raw power are incredibly impressive. And I am so honored to present Maria Guerrero. Thank you. Thank you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you. I have so many thank yous. I'm just going to say thank you quickly to Sarah and Josh, Dr. Tafoya, Tim Z, for 
I just I feel very honored to be between these two people. I'm a big fans of both of their their work. Um, I I'm I'm always in awe of Tim when he reads. I I get sort of caught up in his story and the stories that he's doing. Um, but I'm going to start with um, this book, and I am I did bring my manuscript that is unpublished, but it's supposed to be out in um, January or February of next year, and. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna read. <laughs> so um, I had a great class visit today with uh, Dr. Mejia's um, Chicano Lit class, and uh, I had a really. There was a, a student. I don't know if she's here. I think she's working right now. Kat, is she in here? She's working in the library right now. She asked a question this afternoon about the first poem, which is separate from the rest of the book, and the, the poem is called "Preparing the Tongue." And I'm going to read it first, and then I'll talk about it a little, a little bit. Let me read it first. It's called Preparing the Tongue. In my hands, it's cold and knowing as bone. Shrouded in plastic, I unwind its gauze, mummy-like. Rub my wrist blue against the cactus of its buds. Were it still cradled inside the clammy cow mouth, I should want to enchant it. Let it taste the oil in my skin. Lick the lash of my eye. What I do instead is lacerate the frozen muscle, tear the brick-thick cud conductor in half to fit a ceramic red pot. Its cry reaches me from some heap of butchered heads as I hack away like an axe murderer. I choke down the stink of its heated moo, make carnage of my own mouth, add garlic. So this poem, um, I, I lived in Massachusetts for a while while I was going to school and uh, was missing lengua tacos. So I had to travel a couple, of, a couple of towns over to the Puerto Rican community to find this butcher who had lengua and, um, and uh, went and got something to get home and was on the phone with my mom, how do I do this, how do I do this? So she says, well, I said, the lengua doesn't fit in my little pot. She's like, chop it now, okay. <laughs> um, but as I was doing it, I was totally grossed out. I mean, I had never made a Lego before. <laughs> and I'm holding this thing. It was kind of frozen. I had to unwrap it. Um, and I was holding this tongue in my hand. And there was something really, really sad, but also really, really empowering at the same time. And I thought about all the women who came before me who had held these tongues in their hand, right? And now I'm holding the tongue in my hand. <laughs> and it was really empowering. Um, but I realized, too, that I was holding this tongue in my hand because I was going to feed my children with it. I've got three children. And so as I was, um, I, had, I put the, I put the, I think it was, I threw it in a crock pot and I went and I sat down because I had to write this poem. Um, because I started to realize that um, there was so, it was, it was such a violent thing, right? But also it's a tongue, right? And there's, there's a sexuality about that, too. And then here I was making, um, making it into a meal for my children. So the question that Kat asked today, and I don't know if I can remember it exactly, but she said, uh, um, gosh, can you help me? Do you remember what it was exactly? Yeah. She said, right, 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 right. Yeah. So she, yeah, so she asked if the carnage was my poetry. And if so, what, what is the garlic? Right? <laughs> she blew me away. I was like, damn. <laughs> I didn't think about that for a minute. <laughs> and I did. It took me a minute. But I think, I think for me, I'm just going to share what I shared with her, um, thinking about um, violence and, and the kind of the world that we live in and, the, and maybe the community that I grew up in, um, it was really important for me knowing um, also that, you know, here I was getting an education where, where only my mother was the only one who had done that for me. And um, I, I was trying to take what was in my world and make it palatable for my children. Right, so this tongue, this crazy, this piece, this carnage, right? This carnage, like violence and death and, and fear and hate and everything that we live in. How, how am I going to feed my children from what I come from? That's why the poem is separate. I mean, it's kind of an introduction to what I talk about in the book. So, that's that. <laughs> um, but it was interesting too listening to Tim talk about his grandfather because my grandfather, too, all my grandparents, but my grandfather specifically, uh, for whom I wrote this uh, next collection, um, was, the, was the person who raised me. It was my mother and him. Um, my father, my parents were together, but my father was often um, traveling. 
if he was a construction worker, he had to go where the work was. Um, and so a lot of these poems, I mean, he was the first, um, I'd say that he's the first and greatest poet I knew. Uh, he was the storyteller in our family, and he was the one, uh, because he didn't write, he, he carried stories in his body. And so when, he, when we were picking tomatoes, or when he was showing me how to change the oil, or whatever it is we were doing, um, he, would, he would tell these stories. And because he had told them so often, they were very precise, very well thought out. They were, he, you know, he, he, was a, he was a storyteller. He knew how to turn a phrase. He knew, you know, he knew how to get a reaction from, from me, from his audience. Um, so a lot of these poems are, 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 were inspired by stories he told me and also by things I just, by just observing him. So this, this first poem I'm gonna read is called um, Sundays After Breakfast, which is the time, I called it that because that's the time after I bought Rebel and Big Red, that's where we would go sit on the porch and he would tell us stories. <laughs> so Sundays After Breakfast, a lesson in speech. There were no names for men like that. Gringos who stitched up their, white, their rules, their white garb, laced snug the issues of the day. Lord didn't make us to mix with them folk, they said. But God's got nothing to do with the black boys dumped still alive into a restless river. God's got nothing to do with having to tell their mamas. That bloody water ran through each dark vein across Texas, fed the Gulf, all its brown-skinned people. This grandpa could name, Los Cuerpos, bodies swaying above the cotton like sheets on a line. No importaba que no eres negro, pero que no eres gringo. No, it didn't matter that you weren't black, but that you weren't white. He lived his life this way, silent like every man after him, opening his mouth only to eat, holding his head above the cotton between white men and black boys. took care of him um, for the last five years of his life when I moved back to San Antonio in 2008 and um, it, it was always it was always a it was always an adventure <laughs> with grandpa this one's called Mr. G's collection in the CT scan the tripas look like snakes and one kidney dwarfs its once identical twin I see the lump a wing bud between his spine and shoulder. This is not the cancer, says the doctor, but tissue, a growth, manteca, fat, pregnant back full of children, collection of wounds skinned over like a pie, the many cheated deaths, water for drowning, horse hooks, guns, flipped up pickups, booze to fill a young man's veins, flask, cask, all of it held up there, burden world on his shoulder, a monkey, nest of wrongs, of worms, a blister, meatloaf, coffee hardened to a brick, soap, cake, a womb in which to grow watermelon, a pot of beans, a dozen tamales. He'll tell you it's his bag of money. There, says the doctor, pointing to what looks like the apple core we threw off the jetties in the Corpus Christi Bay when I was four, bobbing in Grandpa's stomach with each breath he takes. There's the cancer. Um, I, I was traveling a lot, well, I'm always traveling a lot, and I met this man on a plane um, I don't remember where I was coming, but I think I was coming home from grad school. Um, and we were both flying into San Antonio, and we had a drink and started talking. <laughs> and um, he was really sad. I could tell he was really sad, and we just started talking. And I asked him what he was, is he from there? Or he said, I'm, I'm flying home. I'm flying home. And I said, oh, I said, you know, good, bad. And he says, well, he said, I'm going to a funeral. I said, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, he, 
can I ask? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, so my best friend, my best friend, and his wife. It's a double funeral. Well, I had just been doing these poems about infanticide and domestic violence, and I wanted to know more, so I asked him. I was like, let me, can I, can I write it down? Can, can, tell me. I said, I interviewed him. You know, I said, would you, would you share with me? And do you mind if I write it down to him? I'm a writer, and I would really love to, to use this. And he said, well, I don't, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know if it's a good idea. I, don't, I said, I won't use any names. I said, I just want to know. I want to know what you're feeling. And so I started writing all these, you know, what he was, you know, with his best friend. They had one child together. He shot her. Um, the child was there. Um, and so I lived with this information for a really long time. I couldn't write about it. It was too close to home. It was too, it was too much. Um, I remember the man's name. I, I wrote down his name, Jerry Rosales. Never saw him again. Um, when I went to finally write the poem a few years later, or maybe a year later, it wasn't even about them anymore. It, it became about what it's like to be a mother, to be a wife, to be in the community that, that this kind of thing happens uh, in. Anyway, this poem is called When I Made Eggs This Morning for Jerry Rosales. I broke them, watched them plop, gooey discharge of egg into a glass bowl, <coughs> Sprinkled them with salt sucked from the sea, pepper cracked with a twist, tiny black skulls flaked and dusted, bone meal. I beat them, whipped them like a monster until the line between yolk and albumen was no longer visible. I seared them in a hot pan, toasted the skins, served them to my children. We ate. I thought of you, rooster man the squawking bird mother you shot by the frying pan. writing. 
and and I was afraid. I was I kind of got scared. Like, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to write about? I don't write the same book. Um, and then my grandfather died a few months later, and I started writing again. Um, so a crown of sonnets is a is a is a, a series of fifteen sonnets. Um, the 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 last line of the first sonnet starts the second sonnet, and the last line of the second sonnet starts the third, and so on. The 15th sonnet is comprised of the first lines of each of the previous 14. It is much harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, but, but, the, but there was a huge lesson in that for me that I got recently, and, and I'm very, very grateful for the form, even though I hated sonnets. <laughs> hated inherited form. I want to make my own form. <laughs> um, but, it, but I'm very grateful, and I love I love sonnets now. It saved my life. So I'm going to read um, a few of these, and I'm going to start with. I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the first one. Let's start from the beginning. Um, so I started these sonnets, I was doing, with, when right after my grandfather died, I started my, my book tour, and the first place I read was at UTEP. And um, being in that space, it was two months after my grandfather died. It was, oh my god, it was exactly a year ago, today, that I was there. Wow. Yeah, whoa, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so I started the, the son, this, this, these sonnets there. And um, I think it was the space of being in an bus so, so close to Juarez, going into this space um, and fe and being in this space and feeling like it was such a it was such a such a weird space and bustle and and and, um, and heavy it felt really heavy and I felt when I was there that there this was a place of grief and I felt like there was a homecoming for me I was I was I belonged there because this is this is this is where you come to be sad that's what I thought I, I returned recently to El Paso because I wanted to finish the crown there. And I realized this is one of the lessons of this of, of El Paso for me was that um, it wasn't a place of grief. I was grieving. Who <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, So this the first poem is called "Where the Dead Come to Speak," El Paso Ciudad Juarez. And maybe there was a Larian who left behind three children, a sink full of dishes, a man who kissed her as if the whole world lived in her mouth. And maybe, too, her heart was carved out from underneath the cradle of her rib. The ocotillo motions with its strange arms. Death goes on. I conjure you in boot soles and sand, ice and hummingbird, border walker and little girl. Have you found my likeness on the other side as I search for you here? I thought you'd be alone. You are not alone. Hadn't they their own fathers to heed, saying, as mine has said, don't be alone, don't cross the line. Number two, love is our mother. You said, don't be alone, don't cross the line, girl. The potential in my hands to raise hell, you knew before I did. We were never good, but to each other. The brain creates its devil. In this dream, he makes me choose which one of us will die by the hand of the other and which will carry the dead home. You kill the boy, or the boy kills you, he says. In this dream, my steady hands are not my own. Your hands load the gun. You know I cannot let him live. His bones cannot hold the weight of me. With my eyes, I see your hands. My eyes see the boy I birthed, my jaw that quivers. You wake me before you pull the trigger. Pray song for the goat at the grave. You woke me before you pulled the trigger, tempting songs from your guitar. Late night, after Gabrito plucked from its mother's body in praise of September rain, we ate. Praise September, praise rain, though I can still taste merciless July. At your grave, I nestle hard candies in wet earth as to return diamonds, as to, as to sow seeds. 
I want your tongue to wind its way through the hinged lip of casket, black rock, pull them down to your softened teeth. Who knows what you're capable of now? What grows now that your heart has fed the dirt? But only goats are here, bleeding songs I do not know. Only the goats are here to say hello. The absence of water. Only the goats are here to say hello when I kneel at your grave. I straighten blue ribbon from your casket, white dust settled in plastic red roses. Your headstone has not arrived. I rearrange rocks, pull newborn weeds that spout, sprout like vocal cords. He's dead, they hum. In my nails, your dirt burrows like worms. My hands are dirty, and you are not here in your blue jeans with your slow eye to throw me a manguera to rinse my hands, to wet my lips, to bless the little bodies of tomatoes trying to follow a sun they can't see, shrinking, puckered on the vine, shaking in their skins, faces split as mine. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, and Newborns. Let's look at our reflections in the mud. See how, in four months, each of us has changed. What is your name without a body? My name without you here. I am you, what I never was. Suddenly, I carry my newborn grief like a new mother. I nurse and swaddle my most fragile, my newest, my sweet. What festers in the bellies of strangers does not concern me. There is only this. I am the only mother. Mine is the only child. I decompose alongside you, wanting and not wanting everyone to see me. Off balanced and leaking, my skin in strands, the oddity that was put in my hands. Dia de los Muertos. The oddity that was put in my hands your truck. It used to be I drove this road each week to pick you up. Now I drive this road each week to lay you down again. Today is the day of the dead. When did you die? Today I bring you chicharrón con huevo, chile, which is to say I brought breakfast to the goats. I want to slip my hand into the photo of you, fix your hair as I did, help you with your sweater, guide heavy salt to your plate. Grass is starting to grow over you. Shards of rock gone smooth, I sing to bees. I lay my ear to stone, it doesn't hurt. I hear your song, water rising from dirt. Sunday dinner. I hear your song. Water rising from the dirt of Sunday. I peel potatoes for your dead mouth. I wear your teeth like an apron, bandolier across my chest. I only know how to feed you and fire. I think I've lost my children too. I look for you in salt, in the red meat of sun. My children are soldiers, lined rows of corn, ears wrapped in silks. Faces tucked in stalks, they have learned the war of keeping. We trudge through the mud of Sunday. At the table, we take from each other's faces little fires. When you were here, I didn't know to serve the meal this way. Good, I would ask. Good enough, you would say. I think I want to skip again. <clears throat> Casketing. I've buried everything I've ever loved in the bone of reason. Now, even in dreams, you are dead. Sometimes I wheel your metal-colored coffin to the grocery store, once to a papery, twice to Fiesta Bakery on Pleasanton. You are heavy. Once I was in high school, in a play, and parked you stage left. Always I shake you. Wake up, damn you. Sometimes the casket is open and I kick you, and when in my small shoes I make contact, your ribs crumble like the bark of an old mesquite. Wake up, wake up. We can't run the numbers, argue. 
make your mother's bread if you are always going to be dead. Um, this will be the last one. <clears throat> Untouchable. If you are always going to be dead, who then will melt away the breasts from my chest? Need more my eyes than the unraveling of my hips. In your house, I was all bedrock and teeth, a stopped clock, just as much man as woman or rain. You were blind and I loved you for it. In your house, my shoulders grew to fit the work. Patience blossomed upon my head, a crown. You were my mirror, my name, ready plumb of my right hand, my ancient and rivered neck, my compass, my wing, my open gate, my warrior, my sleepless legion, as if I had been born male my kingdom come, and one day in hot July, my kingdom gone. Thank you. I feel extremely grateful to be here with these two poets. I know you all do. I feel a sense of uh, amazement. Um, as Laurie-Ann shared with us, a crown of sonnets that was sweet with grief and bitter with the breath of life. And Tim, who carried us in the crash route of a descending plane and immersed us down below the ground of generations, mysteries, and both of them invoking the names of our grandfathers and also the names within our own beating hearts. I, uh, I would like to ask you both, we haven't had enough of you. I feel hungry to hear more. We don't want to be here for three hours. Or maybe they'll kick us out. Maybe we want to be here and they don't want us to be here for three hours. But we need to hear a little bit of just a little bit more. So I'm gonna ask both Laurie Ann and Tim, can you talk to us? Can you talk to us about the role that invoking names plays in your work and in your creative process. What does it do to you when you begin a work invoking a name? Hmm. Um, for me, um, for me, what it does for me is is what I think it does two things, I think, or, or I hope it, it, for me, invoking names um, in this collection and also in this, first, um, it situates me. I think it situates me geographically, um, in time and space, like it just, it situates me. Um, like the, like the, some of the poems in here are dedicated to certain people like Jerry Rosales, um, and then the babies who were buried under the house, or Soraya and Sebastian. Um, Esperanza, who tells us, her friends the story of my um, And so what, I, what it does for me is, um, it, for me, these names are, are reminders of who, I, who I'm from and where I'm from. Um, I'm going to stop there, because I want to hear his answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, you know, um, I, I, actually, I actually asked Pete Seeger, I got to interview him, and I asked him the same question, actually, because he's the one who actually you know, turned this song, he recorded this song and started talking, you know, about names. And so I asked him, you know, what's the importance of names? And the first thing he said was, well, you know, prisoners have numbers. And, you know, that, that got me to thinking, and I, I feel that way. If you want to break down a human being, a systematic breakdown begins, I think, in, well, two things, obviously. First, their language. The other is their name. You know, and I feel that way. And if we look at, you know, any kind of sort of system that wants to sort of, you know, um, that wants to sort of diminish the individual and sort of make sort of group adhere to something. They start, they stop calling them by names, they start calling them by numbers. You know, those kind of systems exist. And so for me, a name um, is our own individuality for one, but it's also our connection to our, our ancestors, our past, etc., which are very alive in us today, all of us, right? All of us have names we all spoke out loud at the beginning. 
we have that coursing through us right now in this instant, you know? And so for me, it's a connection, and it's about acknowledging that connection. And then in terms of sort of the historical sense, the broad sense, I feel like, you know, um, to omit someone's name intentionally or unintentionally, to have your name omitted is to have a sort of a, a link in the chain broken. You know, um, how do you, you know, how do you find out about your past if you only can ask so many questions back and then, and then there's a, a broken link, right? So the names, as long as we continue the names of our family, then we know where we come from. You know, in some countries, your name is also, and I was interviewing one of the gentlemen actually who's in this plane, and one of the, I mean, whose family was a plane member, of, or the, the pilot of the family. He, he, uh, he said, you know, um, the, the name Kesselring, which was the, the stewardess's name, actually, she said, you know, back in, uh, in Germany where that name was at, that, that was, you know, kettle maker. And, and that was what the family did. We made kettles originally far back. So names have all of this within it, right, who we are. So for me to erase the name is to erase the name. Do you have questions you would like to ask of Tim or of Lauren? We have a mic back here. We'd like you to go to it, speak loudly, and let the rest of us take part in this, uh, in this beautiful conversation, please. You know, I want to think really quickly, actually, because, uh, because I want to point to Lorianne's book, A Crown for Women's Single, and because I had the privilege of reading it also. When a poet, when the poet Lorianne decides <laughs> to not just invoke a name, but to create an entire collection based on a name, A Crown for Women's Single, what the poet is doing is offering not only not only sort of an invocation of her own grandfather, she's offering that name to all the, all the sort of omitted names in history. I think it's a powerful thing, and I just want to point that out. And when we think about the, the renaming that occurred for so many generations of Mexican-Americans, I'm positive that your grandfather was not called when we said that in school, that. that they probably called him Jerry or... Uh, he had many names. And, you know, my yeah. grandfather would tell this story that, you know, he, he was 17 years old and he worked for a man, Mr. Mitchell, on a dairy farm. And Mr. Mitchell also taught him to use a circular saw. And Mr. Mitchell, and I, I don't even want to say how they pronounced it because it's almost disgraceful to say the, the way this man called what he called my grandfather. Um, so I'm not going to repeat it, but he, he had this name for him and told my grandfather, uh, my grandfather, when he was a 17 year old kid, right, he tells, tells the man, you know, that's not how you say it. And he says, well, that's how I say it. And, uh, and then he tells my grandfather, you know, boy, you're going to have a real problem with that name. And my grandfather says, I'm not the man who's going to have a problem with that name. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's one of the stories that my grandfather would tell often. But, but in, because it was often, his name is Gumesindo. It's not easy to pronounce, um, but um, but at a certain point he stopped going by Gumesindo. He started going by his first two initials, which are G M. He was known as G M Guerrero. When I took over his care, I took him back to Gumesindo. So, Grandpa, we're going to use your name. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Any questions? Comments? Reactions. Do I yes. have to go back to the mic? Could you? It would help us. It would help us hear you. We don't want to miss your words. I break that thing down for her, okay? Yeah. I wonder if you would tell us some about um, the revision process for your poetry. I've been in a creative writing class and we've been doing a lot of revising of fiction and I wondered if your uh, revision process for fiction and poetry differed or just how you began. Jim, you want to talk about that? That beautiful fiction and poetry? And <laughs> yeah, I was actually yeah okay. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I you know I came by I came to writing. Well, you know, for me, I mean, revision is, is I mean, I I, try, I I allow myself to make mistakes. In fact, I expect myself to make mistakes. You know, and, and in fact, I think for me, anyways, I'm sure it's probably different for every writer you ask. You know, uh, the excitement and allure for ri about writing is are the questions that I have. Right? I don't have the answers. I have more questions. Obviously, I have like more questions. But for me, then, the revision is a part of that. It's a part of re it gives me the opportunity to re-enter that thought, to re-enter, you know, um, whether it's in poetry or fiction, it works the same, you know. Um, you know, uh, 15 drafts of Mañana Means Heaven later, you know, and the same with the, the, same with the poetry books, you know, uh, drafts, drafts later. I feel like it's always an opportunity to go back into, into not just, you know, looking at it from a 
you know, poetic sort of eyeball and going, well, how do I mess with the form and word choice and all that? But the intention, the purpose of why you're saying it, it's an opportunity to go back into that. I look, I look at it the same way, though, whether it's poetry or fiction. You know, it's just about like, re-looking at what you have already. You know, it's pretty basic. Um, well, I mean, revision, revision, revision is my favorite part. Um, I think, you know, when you write, for me, when I write a poem, I, I, I'm s struck by something I need to sit down and write immediately. Um, I pulled the truck over with kids and made the kids late for school because I, I needed to write this stuff. <laughs> this is more important than <laughs> your education, though. <laughs> um, and so there's that, but what I like about revision is I get, I get to it when I get to it. And, but I make t if, I, if I love the poem, and usually if it's a new poem, I love it, and I make time to get to the revision. Um, but for me, I mean, there's so many different techniques that, you know, um, I've, I've cut, I've actually cut the lines of poems and, and rearranged them. Um, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've written it backwards. I've, um, I've, I've swapped out every verb and put the same verb all the way. I mean, I've done, you know, and I've done, I mean, I have one or two poems that have like 40 versions, you know. Um, but but that's, that's the fun, that's, that's fun for me. It's like a puzzle. It's, you, get to, you get to play with it and, and, you know, I mean, that's why I'm a writer. I love that. That's why I'm a writer. But that's part of, that's like a pilon. Like, I get to do that. That's cool, you know, extra. Um, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, if you don't, if you have issues with it, you need to work harder. I mean, you need to, you need to love it. I guess like, it's, it's that's the best part. I think it's, it's one of the best parts. I think that's horrible. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. That's <laughs> when writers are accused of being too childish, of having too much of the kids still alive in them. It just makes me keep thinking that, well, what do children really like to play with the most? What is the toy that never breaks, that you can even play with in the dark? And it's language. It's play. It's language play. And so kids start playing with language. And I think we beat the writer out of them in schools. But basically, they're born being really good writers. And you can go out and collect the folklore of an area that they've done Mapetotera uh, from Austin has done research in this, you know, uh, South Central Texas area, and she found all this incredible language play, word play in, in the children who would make up knock knock jokes, or they'd even make up bilingual knock knock jokes, which means you have to know two languages really well to make the bilingual knock knock joke work. And so they say, like, knock knock, who's there? Uh, chata. Chata who? Chata do. Who's there? Kelly, Kelly who? Kelly Porta. You know, they play it both ways. They want to know both languages. So they are not the born writers. So I'm kind of like pulling the curtain open and you know, pulling our clothes off and saying, what we're really doing, this is what we do when we play with a sheet of paper. We're, we're playing with the words. What will happen? What happens if we turn it upside down? What if I write it backwards like Lorian did? I'm going to write it backwards. You know, my work, you know. And so, um, that that's that's what play is about. Play is allowing that subconscious element to control you enough to allow you to experiment, to take risks, and see what happens if things are approached in a whole different creative way, instead of predictable technical manual. And for all of those of you who've read technical manuals, you know just how much fun they are. Can I say one more thing about revision? Um, I think, you know, like you can go through many, many versions of a, of a poem or, or whatever it is. Um, I think the key to revising is always listen to your gut. Because you'll know. You'll know. You're the writer. You know, you'll know. You'll know what's right. That's all. Any other questions? Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm next in line then. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello. Uh, I would call myself a young writer. And I, about two years ago, I was in a writing workshop, and our leader, who's also a writer, talked to the students about how it's important to maybe understand what are your outside influences as a writer, things that do not explicitly relate to writing. So that could be music, sports, any number of things. So I'm curious about what would be your influences of writers that are not writing related necessarily. Everything. I mean, I think um, hmm. 
everything. I mean, the voices that we surround ourselves with, um, the voices that, that we carry in our bodies, you know, my grandfather, you know, whomever, um, my children. I don't often write about my children. I try. I don't like to write about my children, um, but I'm a mother, and so obviously, I mean, if you read, read my book, I'm very, I'm a mom. <laughs> um, but I think too, yes, of course, music. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I never should think about that before. Go ahead. What's that? Oh, I do. I, I paint. I, I'm a visual artist. I'm a, I'm a, I paint. Um, yeah, I don't know how that really <laughs> 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 that's, kind of what, that's kind of what I do when I need to take a break from writing. I go and I'll, I work with my hands. I'll paint or I'll do some embroidery or build something. For me, the, the inspiration is always um, our stories, you know, our, our each of our individual stories. You know, I said this in the class earlier as well. You know, it used to be when I first started writing, I kept thinking, you know, I've got to look for that one great story, you know, that great story. And, uh, you know, whatever that means. What I learned is that we're all a great story. You know, we're all of us, each one of us, not, no one exempt from this. Each one of us is a fantastic story waiting to be told. And I learned that because actually that was my job for quite some time. In 2001 and 2005, I traveled around the region of San Joaquin Valley recording, listening to everyday folks and listening to their stories. From, from the Cambodian community to the, uh, to the uh, Oaxacan community to the uh, indigenous Mono tribe that's there. And I learned that you, know, you can ask anybody, your neighbor, you know, a little bit about themselves and you'll discover a fantastic story. You can ask yourself, you can ask your grandparents. And you'll discover that each one of you are made of this stuff great books. You know, epic tales of struggle and survival and sacrifice. All that stuff is within our story. So that we are the great story. To me, that's, that's what inspires and influences my writing is uh, I think I've always wanted to sort of tease, tease that out in everybody, you know. Um. I think there's a misunderstanding in the public at large that, um, or, or a very, very amateurish writer said, oh, if only something really interesting happened to me. If only there was like right. something marvelous, some, some amazing story out there and I had this really good material. Well, the material is there. The trick is in taking it and working it. And, and realizing that, that writing is 1% is inspiration and 99% perspiration. You really have to work, you have to do the work of writing um, to make the story evolve, to make it come out, and to make it um, fully expressive of, of where we're at. And whether that's poetry or prose, um, it's still basically the human voice that we hear and the human experience that we are trying to explain in some way or capture in some way on a piece of paper. Yeah. Well, we thank you all for coming. We have one if, oh, if there's one ahead. last question, yeah. Oh, there's two. Two. There's two. Um, so I was just wondering if you guys can recall the moment that um, that you guys uh, not only saw yourselves as being writers, but being the voices of um, of the Hispanic culture. If you guys can recall an event that, that, that helped lead you to that path or made you realize what you guys wanted to do specifically. I don't think I don't think that that's um, I don't think that that's a conscious decision that we make. You know, I think that um, I can. You know, I, I I was interviewed a few years ago um, about my work, and they said uh, they asked me, "What is it like? You know, what is it? You know, how do you how do you come up with your you know do you identify as a ch your poems are like Chicano poem, Chicano poems, right?" Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess they are, right? Because I'm, I'm so, so you know, right? Um, but the same way that I write, if I write a, a poem about a pot of beans, which I do, that's a Chicana poem. Um, but if I write about beads, that's a Chicana poem too, because I'm a Chicana. You know what I mean? I don't think that there's a, there's a, there's not some threshold that you cross, you know, and um, and there's no. Um, you know, some people I think are um, don't want that label or that title. I I know it was really hard for me when I was younger, struggling with um, 
not submitting to Latino prizes, which I won. <laughs> um, because I didn't want to be pigeonholed as just a you know a spokesperson for the Chicano Chicana poets. Um, I didn't want to be pigeonholed. Um, I just wanted I'm an American poet. That's what I am. We're American writers. That's that's who we are. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the realization for me was before I was published when I was reading poetry in you know cafes, uh, you know, and, and events that kind of stuff. And the first time. Um, you know, a complete stranger came up to me um, and said, you know, you're telling a story that reminds me of my grandmother or reminds me of my father. And that, when I had that kind of reception, uh, that was when an, an awakening, I think, in my, myself, sort of my own, you know, um, myself as a writer started to, you know, started to open up that idea. That was the seed. The I seed think, moment, yeah, I think that, that any author or any artist um, their most powerful work is going to come from who they really are, from their most authentic self, from the voice that's deepest inside of them. So all of us, when we're trying to do something artistic, come from that which is most authentic to us. And authentic doesn't mean we have to match anybody else's stereotype or whatever. If you are half Chinese and, and half Armenian, and you come from uh, Wisconsin, um, that's going to somehow be reflected in your work, but you don't have to write it into every line. It's just, what is your voice? What is your true voice wanting to say? And it will carry all the beauty and all the color and all the culture that makes us each unique and different. And Chicano, Latino, Anglo, or whatever we want to call ourselves. Your turn. Come back. Yeah. Step on it. It gets confusing to just let me know. I'm still trying to think through it. So earlier, uh, uh, confusing. Wait, stop. Earlier, well, I, I thought it was interesting that both of you talked about your grandfathers, and earlier, Dr. Poya asked if. Uh, about evoking names, and Gloriane says that it's, a, it's about a time and space. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to say that the grandfather is, I guess, sort of a name, or at least a role. Um, so by invoking your grandfathers, uh, were you trying to reach a specific time and space? And uh, is that somewhere where you're at right now, or you're trying to get back at? Or? Um, hmm. I'm not sure I understand exactly. Um, so uh, okay, well, because, <laughs> okay, so. It's the way I was thinking through it is uh, because uh, there was a question about asking, invoking names. Mm -hmm. And the, the name uh, itself, I said, you, you said invokes time and space. So what kind of uh, time and space were your grandfathers invoked for you and your writing? Uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of time and space are you trying to get back at or trying to bring? Yeah. Or, okay. Or, okay. Or, okay. Or, yeah. Yeah. okay, so for me with this book, The Pronto Woman Sing Those, my grandfather, um, um, because of the history with this name and this idea of, and, and also because I'm the only girl in the family, right? And so I was often overlooked. My name was often not called. <laughs> um, and so hearing these stories and, and understanding the importance of, of names and naming, um, to, to, to invoke his name this way for me at this time, yes. First, it does what I said earlier, which is situates me. Um, because to have, I mean, my grandfather helped raise me, um, and, and like and I said in the last poem, I, I, it, 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 though it, it, it was very important to everybody else in the family, it didn't seem important to him that I was the girl. He was the only one. And uh, so when I invoke his name, it's a, it's a reminder to me of who I come from, but also where I come from. And, uh, and so to write this book, <coughs> um, which is basically a chronology of my grief in the last year, which is new to me. Um, so, so, so yeah, so, so yes, it, it's a, it's a, it situates, I mean, I feel like when I say his name or when I think about him or when I think about his stories or the, the things that he taught me, I feel like my spine is stronger. Like I feel, and that's, and that's, that's what I feel when it settles me. It settles me in my body, in this, on the land. You know, I feel strengthened by that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Gloria. I think that's a beautiful way to draw this program to a close. 
and to thank all of you who've been here to remind you that our books are for sale out there and that we will be staying here at this table for you to come on back by if you want to get a signature, an autographed book um, by these amazing people. Let's have a round of applause.